Nikki Strong, thanks for listening. Welcome to Learning English, a daily 30-minute program from the Voice of America. I'm Ashley Thompson. And I'm Dan Novak. This program is designed for English learners, so we speak a little slower and we use words and phrases especially written for people learning English. On today's program, Brian Lynn tells us about new evidence of a second asteroid that may have hit Earth 66 million years ago. Kelly Jean Kelly tells us about America's 38th president, Gerald Ford. But first, here is Katie Weaver. Serious medical problems connected with pregnancy are rare in the United States, but they still affect thousands of women each year. Problems with a pregnancy can threaten the health of the mother, fetus, or both. These problems, called pregnancy complications, are more common in black mothers. The complications may be among the reasons a higher percentage of black women die from childbirth compared with women of other ethnic groups. Severe problems may force patients and their doctors to consider an operation to end the pregnancy or an abortion. In June, the U.S. Supreme Court ruled that states, not the federal government, should pass laws on the issue of abortion. States with abortion restrictions give special permission for an abortion if the mother develops a condition that is severe or threatens the mother's life. But it can be difficult for doctors to know if a condition is severe or puts the mother's life in danger. Some doctors have told the Associated Press that they believe new abortion limits force them to let patients' health complications worsen. Here are some of the most common pregnancy complications that could lead a doctor to recommend abortion as treatment. Preeclampsia is high blood pressure that can develop suddenly in pregnancy. It happens most often during the second half of pregnancy. The condition develops in about 1 in 25 pregnancies. Symptoms include swollen arms and legs, headaches, and blurred vision. In addition to high blood pressure, patients can develop kidney or other problems. Treatment may include hospitalization, and medicines to lower blood pressure and support the development of the fetus's lungs. Ending the pregnancy by inducing birth or with an abortion may be recommended when the mother's life is in danger. An early rupture of membranes is another pregnancy complication. Membranes in the sac that surrounds the fetus sometimes break at the start of childbirth. In at least 3% of pregnancies, the sac breaks too early. Such breaks often lead to birth before the expected date. The condition increases the chances of infection of the uterus. If the sac breaks before 24 weeks, Doctors may recommend ending the pregnancy. This is because infant survival chances are very low before 24 weeks. Instead of abortion, doctors could monitor the patients and closely watch for signs of infection. This increases the risk of severe maternal complications. Recent studies suggest that the chances of a successful birth are reduced. 
A third possible complication is ectopic pregnancy. Ectopic pregnancies are when a fertilized egg grows outside the uterus, often in a fallopian tube. It happens in about 2% of U.S. pregnancies. There is no chance for the embryo to survive. It can cause the tube to burst, leading to dangerous internal bleeding. Treatment for less severe cases may include chemicals that stop the embryo from growing and end the pregnancy. In other cases, surgery is required, sometimes to remove the affected tube. Doctors emphasize that treatment for ectopic pregnancies is not the same as an abortion. Some politicians who are against abortions have suggested that ectopic pregnancies could be put back in the uterus. They have commented on two unproven case reports from medical publications released many years apart. Some experts say an attempt of this kind would damage the embryo and could not result in a successful pregnancy. Placenta abruption is another kind of pregnancy complication. The placenta is a crucial structure that develops in pregnancy and attaches to the uterine wall. It is connected to the umbilical cord and helps feed the fetus. In about 1 in 100 pregnancies, the placenta separates too early from the womb. This can happen after about 20 weeks of pregnancy. The condition can present a life-threatening risk to the fetus and can cause dangerous bleeding in the mother. Inducing childbirth or ending the pregnancy may be recommended. I'm Katie Weaver. Scientists are investigating the possibility that a second asteroid hit Earth about the same time as the one believed to have killed off nearly all dinosaur life. The investigation is linked to a smaller crater recently discovered in the ocean. Researchers say the crater may have been created by a large asteroid. Scientists have long believed that a large asteroid hit Earth about 66 million years ago near Mexico's Yucatan Peninsula. They estimate the force of the crash to be equal to the strength of about 10 billion nuclear bombs. The strike, or impact, is believed to have caused widespread wildfires, earthquakes, and huge ocean waves, or tsunamis. Scientists also believe the event caused a release of chemicals into the atmosphere that led to severe cooling. The climate-changing event is blamed for causing the disappearance of more than 70% of plant and animal life. All dinosaurs that were not bird-like died out. That strike created a huge crater about 180 kilometers wide and 900 meters deep. Researchers say the newly discovered crater found in the North Atlantic Ocean is much smaller. It is about 8.5 kilometers wide. 
it is buried up to 400 meters below the seabed off the coast of Guinea in West Africa. Scientists found the crater by using seismic instruments. Such tools are designed to measure earthquakes and pick up other vibration signals on Earth. The crater was discovered by Uisdeen Nicholson, a geologist at Harriet Watt University in Edinburgh, Scotland. At the time, Nicholson was working on an ocean mapping project involving seabed spreading. This kind of spreading is what caused the African and American continents to separate over time, leading to formation of the Atlantic Ocean. I've interpreted lots of seismic data in my time, but had never seen anything like this, Nicholson said in a statement. He added that he was surprised to see that the data described a huge crater with very unusual characteristics. Nicholson said the crater has several elements that suggest it could have been created by an asteroid. But he noted that researchers will need to investigate more before that theory can be confirmed. A team plans to visit the crater to drill into the seabed and collect mineral samples. The team's findings were recently reported in a study in the publication Science Advances. Veronica Bray is another member of the research team. She is a planetary scientist at the University of Arizona. Bray used computer simulations to predict the effects that such an impact would have had. The simulations suggested the crater was created by a 400-meter asteroid crashing into 500 to 800 meters of water. She said this would have likely caused a 900-meter-high tsunami, as well as an earthquake with a strength of 6.5. Bray noted the effects of the newly discovered crater would have been much less than the one that hit present-day Mexico, but it still would have added significantly to local destruction. She said the new discovery makes her wonder whether there are other impact craters that scientists have not yet found. Nicholson said his team has considered the possibility that both impact craters could be linked. The researchers said they believe the newly discovered crater could have formed by the breakup of a parent asteroid. Sean Gulick is a crater impact expert at the University of Texas at Austin. He called the find an exciting discovery that could lead to further investigations of possible impacts around the same time period. Despite four billion years of impactors hitting Earth, only 200 have been discovered, Gulick said in a statement. It is thus exciting news whenever a new potential impact is discovered, especially in the hard-to-explore ocean environment. He added, I'm Brian Lynn. Learning English has launched a new program for children. It is called Let's Learn English with Anna. 
the new course aims to teach children American English through asking and answering questions and experiencing fun situations. For more information, visit our website, learningenglish.voanews.com. VOA Learning English presents America's Presidents. Today we are talking about Gerald Ford. Ford was the 38th president, but he was never elected to the position. Instead, an unusual series of events brought him there. Many historians have described Ford as a good man facing a difficult situation. He tried to fix a troubled economy, end United States involvement in Vietnam, and show people that the U.S. government could continue to operate after a crisis. Critics from the two main political parties had problems with Ford's efforts, and voters did not elect him president when they had the chance in 1976. But he is remembered in American history for making many voters feel better about their elected officials. When he was born, the future president was given his father's name, Leslie Lynch King. But the boy's father was abusive. His mother separated from him a short time after their son was born. She asked a court for permission to cancel their marriage. Her request was quickly approved. She and the boy moved from the Midwestern state of Nebraska to Michigan. In a few years, the mother married a man named Gerald Ford. The couple had three sons together. The new family was warm and loving. In time, the oldest boy officially took his stepfather's name and became Gerald Rudolph Ford, Jr. He was called Jerry for short. Growing up, Jerry Ford was a well-liked person and a good student. He was also a top football player. He was named the most valuable player on his team at the University of Michigan. After finishing college, he was offered work with professional football teams. But Ford wanted to continue his education instead. He accepted coaching positions for the football and boxing teams at Yale University in Connecticut. In time, he attended the law school there. Ford's path to politics was similar to that of other presidents during that period. He worked at a law office in his home state. He fought in World War II. He married. Ford's wife was Elizabeth Bloomer. Her friends called her Betty. She had been a dancer and worked as a fashion model. The Fords went on to have four children. When Gerald Ford was 35 years old, he launched his political career. The Republican Party chose him as its candidate for a seat in the U.S. House of Representatives. Ford was elected to represent his home area of Grand Rapids, Michigan. But unlike many other politicians, he did not move on to the Senate or become governor of a state. Instead, he stayed in the House of Representatives for 25 years. The job of congressman was, in many ways, a good choice for Ford. He was well-liked by many voters and other lawmakers. He could help different groups come to agreement. He took increasingly important positions on political issues and in time became the top person in his party in the House. Ford was a strong supporter of Republican presidents. In the 1968 election, Ford advocated for Richard Nixon. Ford liked Nixon's plans for the United States 
as well as his efforts to improve relations with China and the Soviet Union. Both Ford and Nixon were re-elected to their positions in 1972. But by then, major problems had come to light in Nixon's administration. One problem in the early 1970s related to Nixon's vice president, Spiro Agnew. Agnew had been vice president since 1969. Five years later, officials found evidence that he had accepted money from contractors, both while Maryland's governor and as vice president. In answer, Agnew resigned from the presidency. Normally, voters elect a vice president, along with a president, every four years. But by coincidence, the U.S. Constitution had recently been updated to say what happens if the country needs a vice president unexpectedly. It states that the president has to nominate someone for the position. Then a majority of lawmakers in Congress must agree. So, in 1973, Nixon nominated Gerald Ford to take Agnew's position. Nixon was not especially close to Ford, but he knew a majority of lawmakers would likely accept him as vice president. They did. However, Ford did not serve in the position long. In eight months, another unexpected event put him in the Oval Office. In August 1974, President Richard Nixon resigned from office. He was the first president to do so. As a result, the vice president, Gerald Ford, became president. Ford was sworn in as president on August 9, 1974. Then he spoke to the nation on television. He said, My fellow Americans... Our long national nightmare is over. He told people, Our Constitution works. Our great republic is a government of laws and not men. The public had understandably lost a good deal of faith in government officials, and especially in Richard Nixon. Ford wanted to reestablish their trust. But... A few weeks after taking office, Ford used his presidential powers to pardon Nixon. The pardon meant that Nixon would never face a criminal trial or, if found guilty, punishment for his actions. Ford said he believed pardoning Nixon would help Americans begin to recover from their painful experience with the former president. But instead, the move angered many people. They believed that Nixon should be held responsible. They also lost some of their trust in Ford. In addition to these political troubles, Ford faced other difficult issues. The American economy was struggling. His administration had to deal with unemployment, inflation, and the lasting effects of an energy crisis. The high price of oil imports came at a time when Americans were using more and more gasoline. Ford took steps aimed at improving the economy, but critics said he was not consistent. Some criticized him for increasing government spending and cutting taxes. Others criticized him for reducing government spending 
and raising taxes. Ford also oversaw the withdrawal of Americans from Vietnam. An earlier agreement had brought a ceasefire to groups in South Vietnam, North Vietnam, and communist forces. The U.S. officially withdrew its combat troops in 1973. But the fighting restarted. Ford asked Congress to approve military and humanitarian aid for the area. But U.S. lawmakers did not approve the full amount. And in time, they cut military aid. In 1975, communist forces began to take control of Saigon, the capital of South Vietnam. Ford ordered all remaining Americans in the country to leave, along with any South Vietnamese who were connected to the United States. He said that, as far as Americans were concerned, the Vietnam War was finished. Americans did not appear to blame Ford for the troubling end of the country's involvement in Vietnam. And some recognized that the country's economic and energy problems had started long before he became president. But in general, Ford did not have the support of Congress, and many voters did not forgive him for pardoning Nixon. In 1976, Ford officially campaigned for president for the first time. He won his party's nomination in a close race against Ronald Reagan, the former governor of California. But he lost the general election to the Democratic candidate, who said one of his best qualities was that he did not have experience in the federal government. The argument appeared persuasive to many voters, who still did not appear to be enthusiastic about the government. In the 1976 election, nearly half of all people who were legally able to vote chose not to. Ford left the presidency graciously. He said that, because he had not planned to be president, he was thankful for the unexpected opportunity. Although Ford said he was ready to retire from politics, he continued to be active in public life. He advised others on government affairs, published books, and sat on boards and committees. His wife, Betty Ford, also left a lasting effect on the public. As First Lady, she had spoken about her experience with breast cancer. After her husband left the presidency, she also spoke openly about her battle with alcohol and drug abuse. In 1982, Betty Ford co-founded the Betty Ford Center in California to help people get treatment for drug addiction. She announced her husband's death in 2006. Gerald Ford died of heart disease at the age of 93. By that time, most of the public had accepted that one of Ford's biggest achievements was to help the country recover after Nixon resigned. President Bill Clinton gave Ford a Presidential Medal of Freedom for his efforts. And even Jimmy Carter, who beat Ford in the 1976 presidential election, began his inauguration speech by thanking Ford. Carter said, For myself and for our nation, I want to thank my predecessor for all he has done to heal our land. I'm Kelly Jean Kelly.
And that's our program for today. Join us again tomorrow to keep learning English through stories from around the world. I'm Ashley Thompson. And I'm Dan Novak. 